Good morning, everyone. We're delighted the Home Baking Association to partner with NEAFCS and bring you this Baking 2020 Consumer Baking Practices and Trends. This is going to be an exciting workshop that we have jam-packed with speakers from our Home Baking Association members that are joining us today to bring you the latest information. If you look at this uh, slide here, you'll see a list of the Home Baking Association members. We want you to look at that list because these are 33 members to the Home Baking Association that believe in you and, and baking education and bring you resources and support you with their resources from their associations. The Home Baking Association is a nonprofit association and our roots go back to the 1920s as you can see. We have partners that we work with throughout the year and you can see there and we've highlighted in red that NEFCS is one of our most important partners and we're delighted to be able to bring you this pre-conference workshop today. This is our schedule for today, and you're going to see what we're going to highlight here for our program. The speakers, their bios and pictures are on your NEFCS website, Excel event, so you'll be able to look at those. Um, we'll be able to also have this available to you after this as a PowerPoint that you'll be able to review the resources and we'll be sending you baking resources. We'd ask that we will take a couple of questions after each presentation, um, but we'd ask that any of the questions you might have for Ask the Baker that you wait until the very end and then we'll call and ask for those. We also want to ask you to use the chat box for your questions. These are our objectives for today. Um, we're excited that we're going to be able to bring you some research on baking. You'll see some demonstrations. You're going to get lots of resources that you can use in your extension offices. And then at the end, you'll have an opportunity to ask the baker questions that you might have that you would like to ask our professionals. If you would first do this poll question with us. We'd like to know a little bit about your audiences and how you're using training. Thank you for doing that. And as we move along, we'll see what maybe those results are that we have if everyone has finished doing that. And we are going to go to our first speaker. We're delighted to introduce to you David. Oh, there's our resources. Or there you'll see the poll question there that we have gotten. Thank you. Welcome David Lockwood with Mintel and David is our first speaker. Thank you, David. Thank you, Charlene. And I'll get my presentation right up here directly. All right, so just checking. Uh, Charlene, Danielle, can you hear me okay? You're good. Perfect. Just want to, I have started presentations where I talk for five minutes and get a panicked text that uh, there's no sound. So I thought I'd ask. So very pleased to be here today. And uh, my name is David Lockwood. I'm director of consulting at Mintel, which is a consumer market research company global. And uh, so us having done some research for the Home Baking Association at the end of last year um, leverages very nicely into this year. We've continued, of course, looking at the market to see not just how things were toward the end of last year with consumers, but how things are changing this year. So we'll build in a lot of information about what the trends have been with consumers and home baking and how they're changing this year. All right. So just a quick uh, agenda, we're, we're 
going to be introducing right from the start, what do people mean when they say they're baking at home? And what is their own uh, skill level and their baking frequency? And then we'll look at uh, the specific things they bake and also how important is nutrition to them and to which bakers is it important? And a little bit about where they shop and why, uh, both in store and online. And then of course, uh, a section on baking inspiration because that's so important to what all of us do. All right, and uh, so getting right into it, what do people mean when they say baking? So we've kept it fairly simple and you'll see that Luckily, we had done some very similar research for the Home Baking Association in 2011. So we can compare the change over time. And um, so we're asking people, uh, are you scratch bakers? And the way we define that in this case is that you purchase and combine all ingredients separately. And uh, then the second level is maybe you purchase and combine a few, a few ingredients, but without mus using a mix and then the lower level is that you could include using mixes as part of your definition of scratch baking. So uh, um, interesting that uh, nearly half of people back in 2011 said that uh, they purchase and combine all ingredients separately when they talk about scratch baking. And that's gone up six percentage points, which doesn't sound like lots, but when you talk about millions of people home baking, that is a lot. So uh, the the amount of scratch baking or the attention that people put into baking has gone up over time, even before we hit COVID. So you see uh, the poll was actually taken in September, 2019. And uh, we asked 2000 people nationwide about this. So that's uh, quite a big number. Now let's look at not just how they define it, but their frequency of baking, all right? So this looks a little complex, also comparing 2019 to 2011, but really it's very simple. If you look at the, the pie on the left, uh, every day and at least once a week bakers, the change over the last eight years is that there's been six percentage points of people moving from cooking, baking once a week to baking every single day. So that's a big jump in everyday bakers other change is from people who never baked at all to baking a couple of times a year. So also up about five percentage points and the rest of the pie has stayed the same. So uh, again, that's another lens on how baking is becoming more prevalent as a long-term trend. And uh, so the frequent bakers are becoming more frequent and the people who never baked at all are finding uh, at least a couple of occasions during the year to bake. So then it makes sense for us to try to put some numbers behind this. Uh, uh, also, what we know during COVID is that I don't even need to tell you all that people are baking more people who didn't bake are baking people who only baked a little are uh, baking a lot more but they're also baking with more complexity. So that's one of the big shifts that uh, we at Mintel have seen this year is that not just you hear about everybody learning to bake bread, <laughs> possibly for the first time, uh, but then also more complex things are coming into their repertoire. And that's very interesting. We, uh, did a, a 35 country survey separate from Home Baking Association, but surveyed in 35 countries, all kinds of consumer habits. One of them was baking and uh, asked if they would expect to continue baking more after 2020 than they did before. And fully 37% of people say that now that I'm baking more, I expect to continue baking more. And that sounds about right to me. Roughly about a third of people will continue baking more than they did in the past. All right, so trying to put that into numbers, this is a study that Mintel had done. It's actually almost two years old now, October, 2018, but it's from a cooking enthusiast report that we did. And I thought it had a really neat tie into what we're doing. 
So cooking enthusiasts aren't necessarily bakers, but of course there's gonna be a lot of overlap. And the reason I pulled this graphic in is, is because we convert the percentages to numbers. And as you can see in 2017, there were 115 million people who considered themselves cooking enthusiasts. And um, the other, if you look at the graph on the right, uh, the other designations are unenthusiastic cooks, conflicted cooks, infrequent, and non-cooks. So interesting to me that the cooking enthusiasts is almost exactly the same percentage as our daily and weekly bakers. 44% of people are daily and weekly, weekly bakers and very, very much tied to the same number of cooking enthusiasts. And uh, I, can, I can guarantee that number has jumped by at least 13 or 15% this year. So upwards of 130 million people would be daily and weekly bakers. So I thought that was just a useful tie-in for everybody to look at. So what are people baking? This is not gonna surprise any of you, I don't think. Um, but uh, cookies and brownies are the most commonly baked thing. The, uh, the point that I, one of the points I wanted to call out on this slide is that of the 14 items that we survey here, bakers say that they bake nine of them. So the repertoire is fairly wide. It doesn't mean that they bake them regularly, but at least once or twice during the year. So uh, that's a, a very good sign, of course, that people aren't just baking one or two things. On average, and this is across all bakers, not just frequent bakers, but across all of the bakers in our population, uh, the average is that they bake nine of the 14 items. And um, the other interesting point in the study that we did compared to 2011 was that for nearly every item, the incidence of people using a mix declined. So it, it kind of echoes our first slide that I showed on the pie chart where how many people said they were scratch baking using all the ingredients and how many people said they used a mix and called that scratch baking. Fewer people using mixes in, in this kind of baking. So it seemed interesting. How about, we threw one question in for food safety and, and I, I suspect this will at least get a smile out of most of you. So we, we asked if, uh, uh, how often do you follow safe raw food practices when handling uncooked or unbaked flour, such as cleaning spills from surfaces before other foods are placed there? And nearly all the bakers say yes. 93% of people say that they always or frequently follow safe raw food practices. So then we asked, when preparing dough or batter, how often do you taste it or give it to others to taste? Well, 59% say always or frequently. So there's a little bit of a disconnect there, right? That uh, um, uh, people are, are tasting raw batter and dough, but also saying that they always follow safe raw food practices. And I looked a little deeper into this and far and away, the people most likely to say that they always or frequently taste batter and dough or give it to others to taste are the daily bakers. <laughs> so 62% so of daily bakers say that they will always or frequently taste the batter and dough. And it's down to like 29% of weekly bakers and 22% of infrequently bakers. So thought that was worthy of a smile, if nothing else. All right, so how about the importance of nutrition? Well, um, back in 2011, what I said was that uh, America is a treat society. We love our treats. And uh, so sure enough, um, that was not only true then, it's become more true now. Uh, so in the middle there, the premium gourmet and the indulgent, are the things that have grown the most since 2011. And uh, interesting, of course, but uh, the other thing that I think is really important here for the business of, of home baking is that for every one of the items shown here, 17 to 26% of consumers say that that is very important to them. 
So being customizable, all natural, indulgent, whole grain, at least 17 to 26% of people say that that is very important to them. So what that means to me as a marketer of, of food products or working for companies who market food products is that just combining any two of these or any combination of these makes a given product have mainstream likability. Uh, enough people say that that is very important to them. So uh, it's not just indulgent and premium, but uh, all these other things as well. So even high fiber and high protein and whole grain. Uh, but of course, there's a lot more going on with nutrition. So here's the longer list. And what you notice right up at the top, if you're looking at the graphic on the right, is that uh, overall nutritional content is most important. So literally people saying, everything on this list is important to me. <laughs> That's what they mean by that. But then just below that, three, the next three things really speak to what we could broadly call clean label. No additives, artificial preservatives, colors, minimally processed, all natural. You can put that in, in the, uh, the clean label area. And these two things, nutrition and clean label, are two of the fastest growing things this year, meaning during the pandemic. Uh, people want to see things that are both clean label and more nutrition. So that's, uh, this will have jumped up this year. Of course, again, this survey was taken in September of 2019. So those numbers will be even higher for, for these uh, attributes of nutrition. And the other, thing I want to point out is you see the red lines going over to the side. It's where I say in the headline, the importance of nutrition is directly proportional to how frequent you are at home baking. So for minimally processed, as the example I called out, daily bakers say that 87% say that that's very important to them. Weekly bakers less, monthly bakers less. So um, again, probably not any surprise to anybody, but really good to have the data that uh, nutrition is very important to home bakers. And the more frequent you are at home baking, the more you're considering nutrition in everything that you do. And then down at the bottom, just to show that the ones that are less likely to be used, of course, you know, not as many people require gluten-free products, but they're just as passionate. The daily bakers uh, are... Uh, believing that, that that is very important to them, that gluten-free is an option for them, weekly bakers and monthly, a little less so. So uh, that uh, shows uh, just how important nutrition and home baking is. So any message you're trying to make to home bakers, include nutrition. Uh, and then this is something that Mintel does. We have something called the Global New Products Database, which draws in, we put every new product that hits grocery store shelves into our database is as many as close to every product as we can get. Um, and so there are millions of products in this database and we capture everything that you can capture on a package that there is, including claims that are made. So we have a, a graph here from 2014 to the present and I'm looking at the percentage of all new products that make any kind of a natural claim, so has almost doubled from 22% to 41%. And in 2020, I, I took the data as of the last day of August. So we've got the full eight months of data and we're just taking a percentage of the total. So it does match up very closely with the other years. And then looking at the in, some of the, in, just some of the individual claims, GMO free has grown, grown, grown a lot and is still growing. Uh, organic, a little less so, but still growing as well. Uh, and interestingly, no additives and preservatives have, have declined. So the important thing here, I had to look into that and see why. First of all, we're not looking at all food products in this graph. We're looking at baking ingredients, baking mixes, sugars, and sweeteners. So those four kinds of categories and uh, those kinds of categories, no additives and preservatives just aren't used as much anyway. 
But the change that has occurred this year is that uh, there's more private label products being launched than there are branded products. And that they are less likely to make no additives uh, preservatives claims. Also, some of the big launchers last year, for instance, uh, you probably wouldn't guess that uh, Nestle, uh, of course, launched a lot of products last year and hasn't launched any products in this particular set of categories this year. And they always make no additives preservatives claim. Same with one of the fastest growing small, small brands, Kodiak Cakes, um, hasn't launched any products this year. They also make no additives preservatives claims all the time. So I wouldn't read much into that number having gone down. All right, moving on about shopping. Um, this is, sorry, this is kind of an eye chart with lots of data on it. But if you look on the graph on the left, about this is where people say they always or almost always shop. And no surprise down near the bottom, supermarkets and grocery stores and mass merchants, mass merchants being largely defined by Walmart, Target, uh, are the most likely to be always or most almost always shopped. Uh, interestingly though, they're the two that have also fallen the most since 2011 in frequency. And of course, what that means is that people have started finding more channels that they like to shop at. Online retailer being the number one of those, but also club stores has gone up a lot. Um, dollar stores have gone up significantly uh, and even convenience stores. So um, that's how, where people shop. And I thought the graph on the right would be useful too, just to show if you're not always shopping there, but frequently that places online only retailers up right near the top, right? So uh, there's no question that while buying food online is still not something all of us do, we'll see in a minute how many, it is definitely the fastest growing channel and will be for the next several years. All right, and that's where that comes in. So how many people do shop online? Well. 80% of us say that we do all of our shopping uh, in store. Then the 13% say, people say, I do most of my shopping in store, but some of it online. And then 5% say equally in store and online. And a very small slice say they always shop online. So that means though, 20% of people, and this is bakers specifically, not just all people, 20% of bakers are doing some of their ingredient shopping online. This was as of September, 2019. And I've done the work for how sales have changed this year. And my estimate is that if I did this survey again, bakers would, 33 to 37% of bakers would say that they're buying some of, at least some of their ingredients online. So that's up obviously uh, about two thirds almost double uh, at the top month. Uh, so um, that's one of the behaviors, just like baking at home is one of the behaviors that uh, people have learned during COVID that they will continue doing. Shopping online is another of those behaviors that will continue going forward. All right, so baking inspiration, where do we get that from? Um, well, the most important motivators, number one, being able to control the ingredients you use in food, that is by far number one, even beating out keeping up family traditions. Those two together are, are by far the leaders uh, in terms of motivators. And also they've shown very large gains since 2011. So controlling food is the number one, controlling the ingredients you use in food is the number one thing. Uh, which is, which is uh, very important. And cutting down on shopping bill, that's still more than half of people. And no question that will have gone up this year as well, um, because that is also a, a COVID behavior. Uh, okay, I'll just move on from that. Um, so the ones at the top, no surprise here, right? I bake for special occasions. Everybody knows everybody does that. I bake to share with food, friend, foods with friends and family, no surprise there. Uh, but we were interested in how the ones below that would 
compare to the ones up at the top. Baking activity is fun to do with children. Overwhelmingly, yes, even though we know only about a third of households have kids, everybody still associates baking with uh, children, uh, which is a, a great thing, well, as you all know. Uh, but then also bake as a hobby for myself. I was very surprised that that number is that high, 70%. So that tells you in the baking world, no matter what part of what your role is in the baking world, communicating with people as knowing that they consider baking a hobby is more likely not more likely true than not because 70% of our, our bakers say that they bake for themselves as a hobby. So it's, you don't have to start off the conversation saying, well, I know it's a chore, but no, I know you like this is, is the way to position conversations with uh, anybody who's a home baker. Um, this one, uh, where, you learn what, where you learn to bake, no surprise, right? At home from a parent or a relative is, is the most likely thing. Social media is next. Now I didn't, we didn't ask social media as a single response in the survey, but I was able to build that number in based on other research that I do at Mintel. So I'm pretty confident just to say that the number two place after a parent or a relative to have learned about home baking is social media. So, um, and the rest fall down, of course, still very important secondary places to learn as your first, second or third motivator is home economics, early childhood programs, after school, community programs. Um, yeah. And then looking at uh, uh, specifically where people get their inspiration online, uh, the major platforms, YouTube, Facebook, Pinterest, Instagram, of course. Um, and then uh, blindly, of course, nobody knew that this work was being done for the Home Baking Association. Still 7% of people said that they go, they turned to homebaking.org. So that's actually a very good response, given that it wasn't prompted in any way. Um, and then, so uh, I'll move on since I'm running low on time. Some quick takeaways that you can act on and these you can think about later. Uh, Pre-pandemic, before this started, the number of home bakers was at least holding steady and, and of course will have grown dramatically post-pandemic and many of those will stay. Um, uh, scratch baking increasing the complexity of baking, the things that they are baking is becoming more complex, no question about that. Um, position home baked goods against the alternative in terms of taste health, enjoyment, and cost. Those are the four things that home baking can sell itself on. Um, taste, health, enjoyment, and cost. Um, and because we know that nutrition is extremely important to home bakers, and that includes not just the, uh, you know, fat, sugar, salt components, but everything down to allergies and diets and, and even finding unique ingredients. Um, clean label, natural, organic, free from, also highly attractive to bakers. Don't forget indulgent and premium, right? Because that's part of the motivation for anybody baking anything. Uh, and that's a legitimate thing. One more slide here, online baking ingredient purchases, still relatively low, but don't forget that that will be the fastest growing area for years to come. And uh, uh, lots of ways to play into that uh, particular market, uh, even for direct from brand website sales. Um, people can uh, take motivation from that as well. Then uh, uh, I mentioned cooking enthusiast study once, and I feel like what comes out of that, a good takeaway here is that uh, the group to go after is not non-bakers because that's a relatively shrinking group. It's the conflicted bakers, the people who bake, they're twice as likely as other groups to have children. They just never learn to like baking. And partly that's uh, a skill level and comfort. Um, sometimes it's just that it does, they feel like it takes too much time and, and isn't easy to fit into their schedule. But nevertheless, those are the people that are the, the most easily converted, I think, is conflicted bakers. All right. And last slide for me. 
Um, I think uh, engaging consumers through social media about corporate responsibility is absolutely appropriate and important for all of us. And I like to tell all of my clients, if, if you are passionate about the social initiatives that your company or association does, then you should be doing it loudly enough to inspire consumers to get involved. So in some way, get those uh, consumers active and engaged in the uh, social initiatives that you take uh, part in. And then finally, last point, uh, the top two home baking motivators, controlling in the ingredients that I use in cooking is the reason people are doing it. Maintaining family traditions is a close second. Uh, so hope that was all helpful. I'll be around for the whole rest of the morning to, uh, to, to talk and, and participate in questions. And I believe, Danielle, do we have a poll question? We do. How are you supporting increased consumer interest in home cooking and baking skills now and into 2021? Give you just a minute to make your selections. And Danielle, when it looks about right, you can share the results. There we go. So very widely spread. So that is interesting. Um, just as home bakers uh, participate in a lot of different kinds of baking, uh, the people involved in home baking have a wide variety of the ways that they are uh, supporting an increasing interest in home cooking and baking skills. I like that. Thank you, Danielle. And I'll Stop sharing for whoever wants to share next. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. Welcome to Bust Baking Ingredient Myths with Steam. And this is with Sharon Davis, that's me, and Ali Sweetek with the Sugar Association. We're gonna focus on two specific um, ingredients in baking that there are myths often swirling around in the last year or two, or maybe slightly more. So next slide, please. We'd like to enlist FCS in that, as usual, um, consumer education effort to bust those myths and bring the facts forward. So the STEM relationship with FCS is key to that. Um, Extension has provided STEM opportunities in school, out of school, through 4-H, through camps and other um, events in the summer as well. So um, we wanna just highlight that this is part of FCS's strong point. And if you look at it as one of our strong points is to plan, manage, and provide scientific research and professional and technical services to learning relative to that. So um, you can go to FC, AAFCS's website to find this STEM relationship, but we want to highlight that those um, connections with youth fall under our um, FCCLA, 4-H and youth out of school programs and even with extension, most importantly, the local businesses that you work with. Next slide, please. We frequently do STEM education in robotics, but I'd like to just highlight again that adding the art is not spending less time on STEM. It actually injects the sense of play and sparks the imagination that most young people really want. So in baking, um, we have that connection very much so. Um, it, it is actually the number one reason why youth want to do STEM activities. So from here on out, we're going to call it STEAM. We add the A for culinary or baking arts. And it is 
hands-on learning with some of the partners in After School Alliance and National After School Association that you may want to explore further um, as extension professionals. Next slide, please. <laughs> Baking STEAM covers a lot of um, topics and in HBA we offer, you see in the upper right hand corner, the lab manual. It covers ingredients from all of these categories with components that go with it. Agriculture, the baking ingredient innovations that um, David just mentioned cover a wide span between cereal grains through sweeteners and vegetables and, and fruits included. Um, we also look at eggs as well as dairy and non-dairy. And of course there's chocolate, we don't wanna miss that. So any one of those ingredients has a lab um, section in our lab manual that addresses some of the baking steam um, components that we might be able to do. There's also brewing, which we don't get to cover, but maybe you do. Consumer research, leavening, milling, nutrition, and we love to focus on the portion control in baking steam. It's part of the math and it's part of the nutrition focus that we need right now in this country, portion control. And then there's sensory sciences. Next slide, please. The objectives for teaching baking STEAM are not exclusive to these four, but they really do um, are important to what we're talking about today with myths. One is the reduction of peer or media influence. And this is done by teaching actual hands-on baking and the ingredient knowledge. So as David mentioned, every aspect of nutrition is directly proportional to how frequently people bake. They want to learn the nutrition and we need to offer it as part of the science. Improve, we can improve family and personal nutrition and economics, not to mention relationships. So um, we want to hit on the economics right now due to COVID and people's job losses, but there is a wide cost differential when you're buying due to trends. And so people need to know why they're buying, what they're buying and just what, um, impact that has on in terms of their um, pocketbook. So today in this session, we will talk about that impact of choosing to buy high end products um, that maybe we wouldn't need to if we really understood the ingredient that's just a standard private label product or branded product that's in the grocery store. We want to promote online best food safety practices and we want to refute the myths that swirl around those. And the one David mentioned most um, frequently done is of course the consumption of raw ingredients. And we'll hit on that again with Chef Martin's um, session on temperature. But you'll see here that already we've launched a cookie dough this year that's safe to eat raw. And it's advertised that way. The problem for home bakers is that obviously um, almost two thirds of them are eating raw ingredients that are not safe to eat. Then we want to explore the future careers or local business opportunities that are out there for your, your um, um, consumers in your communities. Next slide, please. We want to build on the current surge in home food prep so we spend less. We can achieve clean label because home baked is clean label. We can achieve those goals for nutrition. We can shelter and invest that learning in baking so that we, we really have something when we leave sheltering. We can more fluidly move to preparing food at home, which is really why people think it takes so much time is the skills are not set. However, they're getting more set now and we wanna, um, we wanna use that as a platform. So we wanna help our consumers think critically and whether or not they could prepare a food affordably and do they really need to invest in some trend or myth that's out there. Next slide, please. We mentioned this, I'm gonna move past this. It's the same thing that um, David just told us about controlling ingredients. It is more important to our consumers than even the family tradition. Next slide, please. The expectations David mentioned or touched on this, but our consumers are absolutely plugged into what's happening with, happening with our environment and what we can do as consumers to have an impact on that. They want sustainable, even if they don't know what that means, 
they want that as a priority. And so we need as extension and FCS professionals to help them understand what is sustainable, what can be done on a, in agriculture or in our own food production at home to sustain um, a better, less food waste, better investment in the foods we buy. The ingredients they want, they want them to be natural, clean label. They, they often will focus on ancient where grains is concerned that can become very expensive as an investment with a very little return in terms of um, nutritional benefit. So um, it doesn't mean we have to say that those ancient grains in any way are bad, but they're very expensive. And I will show you in a minute some of the research that goes with that. Um, I would just say we want to promote those reliable resources always. And HBA always turns to university extension research first. You are our partners and we believe in you. Um, the other thing that we really, really like to promote is the insight.org website that's provided by International Food Information Council. So if you haven't been accessing that, it's a great, reliable place. And then Food Business News allows you to keep up really well with the trends. If you've never subscribed, you might want to do that. Above all, we want to be able to define, examine, and teach, and test bake. Any opportunity we can provide for that STEAM, that hands-on, um, we're going to gain ground faster than us just talking about it. Next slide. That test kitchen science is wrapped up in one lesson plan we offer you and then the entire lab manual. Um, we have a whole deck of, um, you see the pink card in the middle, there are five cards that allow you to do automatic lessons with consumers. All of this is test kitchen science that we've condensed either into um, a longer lesson plan like the lab manual or a short lesson plan like kitchen science or the really fast lesson plan that's on those um, guide cards. Next slide, please. So just a brief and very quick update to say there are two major pieces of research you will want to access um, and, the, and they come from, one is um, our own ag um, universities, Washington, Ohio, Kansas, University of Arizona, and Oklahoma State University, all have been doing research on ancient and heritage grains, gluten, what we can do, um, to work with the existing wheat that we have to make it more gut friendly. And one important piece is that first bullet where we say that ancient or heritage wheats are actually better for us. That is a myth based on research. Doesn't mean they're bad or any worse for us, but they are more expensive than buying what is on the grocery shelf. And it will not benefit your ability to digest gluten or to um, change your gut health or your long range brain health, which is also myth. So the second one has to do with gluten and gut health in terms of research on the gen genomics, how wheat is constructed. And Washington State has, has partnered with Clemson, Chile, France, China, anyone who, who is most focused on this topic, they have been working on ways to integrate the right gene in the wheat sequence so that we will be able to digest better that wheat. So you'll wanna track that as well. Next slide, please. We have to develop critical thinking. I throw these up here, here. We'll turn it over to Allie next because sweets make a big difference in our lives. We want a happy gut. We have books that tell us that, that we should not eat and look at the list. We shouldn't have sugar, we shouldn't have gluten, we shouldn't have dairy, we shouldn't have GMO soy or GMO corn or legumes, but we can eat all of these higher end, more expensive non-gluten products. This raises flags in my family and consumer science's mind. It's expensive. This mix right here in front of you will probably cost you about $5 for 10 pieces of brownie and that doesn't seem right. So we'd like to go back to the sweetener myth and turn it over to Allie to give us some critical thinking, things that we can do with her new STEM kit. Thank you, Allie. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Uh, good morning. Um, so we're going to actually start off with a poll question here. Um, just to see how much time do you spend uh, specifically teaching on the topic of sugar in your foods education or extension program? So I'll give everybody a minute to answer that. Uh, 
when it looks like we have the results, then they'll pop up. Oh, wow, that's so interesting. That's, uh, I was interested to see if it was going to um, come up frequently or not, or if it was going to be a wide range. And we do have a bit of a range, um, but that's good that it comes up pretty frequently in your classes. Um, because we just developed um, this new uh, theme packet. It uh, focuses on grades 7 to 12, um, but knowing the importance of STEAM in the classroom and the need for the materials, um, that's why we created this resource. Um, again, a focus on grades 7 to 12, and um, there's information about sugar's history and origin and why it's in foods and more. Um, so we're really excited to make this free resource available to um, educators and community leaders. Um, it can serve as a really great supplement to classroom enrichment um, and another tool in your toolbox during a time of learning at home um, and virtual learning. Um, so as a STEAM material, it does cover a wide range of topics, as I said. So history to science, it does include vocabulary um, for each topic, as well as activities and experiments. Um, there are, of course, also a couple of recipes um, for everyone to try. And so this can be downloaded for free from our website or ordered in bulk for free as well from the website. Um, so here are a few examples of the activities that are included, uh, reading food labels, baking, making your own brown sugar. Um, so to give you a taste of how a, a few myths about sugar are addressed in the steam packet, we'll look at a few related to how sugar is produced, um, why it's in food, and how much we're consuming. Um, so first up is where does sugar come from? Uh, sugar is a product of photosynthesis. It's the process by, that plants use to transform the sun's energy into food. So sugar comes from plants. Um, while that might seem obvious to some, uh, there are definitely many people who don't stop to think about sugar's origin. Um, so as you can see, all green plants make sugar, but each varies in how much they produce. So of all the plant types, sugar beets and sugar cane have the greatest quantities of sugar which is why they make the most efficient choices for sugar production. Um, so you'll find more information on sugar beets and sugar cane plants in the steam packet itself. Um, so moving on to two myths that you've probably heard of before, uh, that sugar is highly processed and that white sugar is bleached. Um, so sugar is actually minimally processed um, ingredient and the sugar found in the plant is naturally white. Um, so I'll show you that process here. Um, so in the steam packet, we do explain this process of getting sugar from the plants to your pantries. And there is a slight difference in the process for sugar beets um, versus sugar cane. So um, in both cases, the sugar juice that's extracted from the plant is filtered to remove the non-sugar plant materials like soil and plant fibers, and then it's crystallized. So then those crystals go through a few cycles of washing and spinning in a centrifuge that removes the naturally present brown molasses, resulting in the white sugar. It's almost like the spin cycle on your washing machine. Um, so students will also learn about the co-products that result from sugar processing and what they can be used for, because very little is wasted in the sugar processing um, process, uh, which makes it really friendly to the environment. Um, another myth is that sugar is hidden in food. Um, sugar is added to food for many functional reasons. Um, that ranges from balancing acidity, like in salad dressings and sauces, um, to preventing spoilage, like in breads and canned vegetables and prepared foods. Um, so while sugar may not be in foods for the reasons you may expect, um, it isn't hidden in foods. The food labels on the back or the side of the pack always show the list of ingredients. Um, they'll be in descending order of weight. And so now all products are also um, required to include both the total sugars and the added sugars content on the nutrition facts panel. So that should make it easier to call out. Uh, we explore the science behind sugars function in the steam packet as well. Um, we also have an activity on reading the new nutrition facts label. Since, um, some people do find it confusing still. So. Um, so on the topic of functional roles in sugar, um, I believe Sharon actually has a great activity related to this as well, but reducing sugar in a product often isn't as simple as just cutting the sugar in the recipe because of the other functional roles that sugar can play. Um, so, for example, sugar can be added to cereal to mask 
um, the bitterness of fiber um, or added vitamins and then in increases the bulk and lengthens the shelf life of the product. Um, several ingredients will need to be added back in to replace the, all those functions that just the one ingredient that sugar um, provides. Um, there's really no substitute uh, for that just for just sugar. Um, and you can see the dietary guidelines also Here's recognizes that, oops, sorry, that functionality. Um, added sugars provide sweetness that can help improve the palatability of foods, help with preservation, and or contribute to functional attributes such as viscosity, texture, body, color, and browning capability. All right. Um, so the last myth that we're going to cover is um, that Americans consume more sugar now than ever before. So in fact, uh, while added sugars consumption did increase sharply in the 1990s, since then, consumption has been on a significant decline so over the last 20 years. Um, in the 2015 to 2016 range, added sugars consumption was close to 12.6% of total calories, um, which is around 260 calories a day. So this is still slightly above what the 2015 to 2020 dietary guidelines recommends, which is 10% of calories from added sugar per day. So we are closer to that um, percentage than I think most people would realize. Um, and in addition to presenting these numbers in the STEAM packet, we do share um, where these data points come from because knowing the source of information is another important STEAM skill. Um, right. And then just a, a little bit more about our resources here um, and also Home Baking's resources. I don't know, Sharon, if you want to touch on any more resources that you guys have, but our website has a ton of resources. You can download them all for free. You can order them in bulk for free as well. Um, so whatever works best, whether you're virtual or whether you are back in class, um, we have a ton of resources that we can provide in addition to home baking's resources. That's great. And, then I do, and we have one more poll question here. Um, so I'll, this one's a little bit longer. So when talking to your clients or students about nutrition, what content would you say you would prioritize the highest? This one's a little bit of a longer question, so I'll give you guys a, a minute or two. When it seems like we've got everybody's information submitted, they'll flip over the results and we can take a peek at if there's one that stands out to everybody. So it does look like ingredients labels are definitely that that top answer, which um, with all the, the changes to the nutrition facts label and to um, a lot of people don't realizing that you should also look at your ingredients label in addition to the nutrition facts label, that does make a lot of sense. So um, if anybody uh, has any questions, just let me and Sharon know or drop them in the Q&A or you can always ask us at the end as well. I'll be here. Absolutely. Just, I'd just like to pop in a sec and say that um, one favorite activity I like to do with STEM, a STEAM, is to use that ingredient label. When they identify the sugar, then we go back to cross-check on your chart, Allie, why is the sugar in there and what, what role does it play? I think that that's really important because the point that if you take out the sugar, and use an artificial sweetener, for example, the intensity of that sweetener might be there, but you might have to add another ingredient that is more complex just to bulk the product in baking. So I agree, I agree with you, Ali. It's just really important to use those labels and it's all part of the STEAM education. So it does look like we have some questions. We have one question so far. So I think this is probably for Sharon. What was the reason of offering consumers a safe raw cookie dough 
when we educate consumers not to taste raw doughs. This just confuses consumers. Well, this, I would just completely concur with you. It's all money. It's about money. It's, it's a fact that, that they know that's what consumers are doing and that that's what many consumers chat about online all the time is I'm going to mix up some cookie dough so I can eat it. And then there are the books that are out and the um, restaurants that and, and hospitality um, venues that offer cookie dough bars. So um, it's a matter of making money. You as an, we as facts ex educators, um, I guess we can, we can, well, we can just hope to educate about how many calories you, you consume in that uh, effort that really maybe, can you afford it? We have to ask people to do that critical thinking. Can you afford those calories? Is that your dessert for the day? How much of it are you consuming? I mean, all of those evaluations are important to our health. Why are they doing it? Because it will sell. And because um, maybe they're doing us a favor in that they're labeling it as safe for raw consumption. Maybe that will raise the question in our consumer's mind that they shouldn't be eating other raw dough, whether homemade or from the grocery store. If I had my vote, I would not have that product there. I, I would not. I would not have it. But of course, I'm not going to get to dictate, am I? Sharon Davis isn't dictator of the retail <laughs> grocery <laughs> case. Thank you for that question. I'd love to know what you would do about it too, in terms of education. Okay, I think that's all the questions I see in chat. All right. I think we've got Cindy and Julene up next. Is that right? Okay. Our next, here we go. Okay. Good morning from the Kansas Week Test Kitchen. My name is Julene Darushi, and this is Cindy Falk. We're the co-directors for the National Festival of Reds. And we are just delighted to be with you this morning. Home bakers across the nation are finding creative, convenient, and tasty ways to add value to their baking. And we're excited to share a few highlights from the sixth biennial festival event that was held on June 8th in 2019 in Manhattan, Kansas. We're also going to share ingredient and baking trends that we gleaned from the recipe entries. The title sponsors of the National Festival of Reds are Red Star Yeast, King Arthur Baking Company, and Kansas Wheat Commission, which is funded by our Kansas Wheat producers. And I just want to say that we're a proud member of the Home Baking Association. First off, we are honored by MSN.com. We're declared uh, the National Festival of Reds as the best food festival in Kansas. And just a bit of history about the festival. Uh, the Kansas Wheat Commission, along with the Kansas Wheat Hearts, started a Kansas Festival of Reds in 1990, and it evolved with the first National Festival of Reds taking place in 2009. And it has since continued to grow. It's become a very popular event with the assistance of many volunteers, including extension professionals. And so we're really pleased to be able to speak to our extension friends today. A quick shout out and thank you to our friends at K-State Research and Extension who have played a major role in making this event a success from the very beginning. The National Festival of Breads gives value to home baking. Our goals are to host an educational, family-friendly event. Uh, we feature a baking contest and baking demonstrations. It showcases beautiful breads that are then auctioned off to raise awareness and assist our local food bank. Cindy and I think that one of the, part of the fun parts of the festival is seeing the colorful decorated kitchens that our eight finalists work in. 
pictured here is a map showing where the 2019 finalists were from. As you can see, they were from all across the nation. And if you're curious to learn more about the finalists and their recipes, I invite you to click on the link there on our screen and uh, you'll see you'll be able to read the feature stories and recipes on the National Festival of Reds website. Also on the website, you'll find pictures from our past events. One of the highlights is the field to flower farm experience where our finalists get to uh, meet a farm family, ride in a combine and tour the farmer direct, mi uh, direct mill where King Arthur's white whole wheat flour is milled. <clears throat> One of the great ways that home bakers add value to breads is through bread shaping. And as you can see, just by looking at the pictures there, um, these breads rose to the top because they are, are attractive and they're unique shapes. Uh, for example, the rolls up in the left hand corner are shaped like a rose. You can see the decorative slashing and twisting. And in the lower right hand corner, the bread is shaped to look like a loaded baked potato. Other examples of bread shaping were on display in our bread sculptures for all seasons, which showcased over 30 breads and rolls uh, that were made by Cindy and myself. And these are also featured in our 2018 Kansas Week Commission recipe booklet. And you can find step-by-step -step instructions and photos on our website. Pictured here are the expert chefs and cookbook authors that gave baking demonstrations for the festival. Home Baking Association's Charlene Patton and her family were among our featured speakers. And you know, we all know that people love to learn by watching. And so teaching baking skills is really a top priority at our event. Uh, we estimated that 3,500 people of all ages attended our 2019 festival. The Ask the Baker session provided by the Home Baking Association was a new and very popular uh, activity at our event. The Home Baking Association is a valued partner of the festival. Sharon Davis and Connie Neiman presented a variety of baking topics and answered consumer questions. Um, I just really encourage you to visit homebaking.org to check out all their wonderful resources. And as a Home Baking Association board member, I encourage you to check out the brand new baking, Home Baking Society opportunity that will be coming soon to their website. Yeah, a favorite part of the festival is announcing the baking contest champions. And we'd love to reward bakers' creativity and celebrate their skills. Uh, and the 2019 champions were food blogger Mary Graham. Uh, she's from California and she has the Blackberry Ginger Speculus Danish wreath. And the home baker champion was Rochelle Hudsmith smith from Utah with her chai ube rosette rolls. And uh, at the end of our presentation today, we'll show a, a short video clip demonstrating the shaping of her rosette rolls. Now Cindy will share what we learned from the recipes. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, online entries included a recipe history, detailed information, instructions, and a photo of their bread. Um, we had entries that came in from California to New York, and Julene and I really enjoyed reading and reviewing hundreds of recipes to gather all this information to share with you today. Um, we're in it for the dough. A variety of flours and grains were used in the recipes. And um, we found that there's a rising interest in alternative flours such as almond, joy, uh, soy, and potato flour. With each contest, we have seen an increase in the use of the white whole wheat flour. And Julene and I have been promoting white whole wheat flour and baking with it in our test kitchen for years because most of it is grown and milled in Kansas. And it is a whole grain that is lighter in color and sweeter in flavor. And if you haven't tried it, we encourage you to look for it in your supermarket baking aisle. Next, the rising star is Red Star Platinum Superior Baking Yeast. Uh, seven out of eight finalists used platinum yeast in their winning recipes. And one baker stated, Red Star Platinum Yeast is very active with impressive oven spring. 
Another award-winning ingredient ingredients included um, a variety of cheeses, such as goat cheese, smoked cheeses, flavorful cheeses, and then chocolate, chocolate in all forms. Coconut ingredients. We have seen in the past few contests an increase in using all forms of coconut and a variety of fats to make breads flavorful and tender. Home bakers use a variety of flavors to fire up the taste buds and to increase the appeal and value of their bread. Vanilla, all forms of tangy citrus, chili sauces and powders, and tea. Tea is hotter than ever. We noticed over the past few contests that bakers like to add tea to their bread. Move over table salt. Bakers like to specify salt such as pretzel salt and applewood smoked salt. A variety of bold spices were used like the tar and Chinese spice spice. Plus, you know, fresh and dried herbs are always a staple in breads. Bacon and ranch, well, everybody loves them and they uh, incorporated them in their recipes. Color, color, color. Bakers were intrigued by the use of color. Everything from beets to turmeric to butterfly pea flowers, which was a new ingredient for us, and purple ube yams and purple corn were also used for colorful bread. Jingling and I especially like all the fruits that bakers add to their breads to make them a very healthy treat. <laughs> this included every fruit from fresh to dry, including Montana cherries, to frozen and canned. Wholesome veggies were used in many of the recipes. Um, cooked broccoli, um, chopped pickles, sauerkraut, and marinated artichoke hearts were probably the most novel veggies. Other veggies that were added, um, the spice of life, the added spice of life in recipes included onions and peppers of all colors. And then a variety of seasonings added flavor and originality to the recipes. Well, a nostalgic ingredient used is peanut butter. A finalist from Georgia used powdered peanut butter in her peanut butter pretzel rolls as shown here. In addition to um, traditional nuts, Nutella is also becoming a very popular ingredient. Many forms of sweeteners were added. For example, southern cane syrup and bourbon smoked sugar. The food blogger champion recipe featured blackberry seedless jam that was complemented with lemon zest, ginger, speculous spice, and fresh blackberries. Move over tap water. Specific types of water were used. Inventive, liquid, inventive liquids were um, pickle juice, mm, um, chicken broth, and spiced rum. Almond milk, goat milk, and soy milk were really trendy liquids. And some bakers are using ingredients to improve, improve texture and shelf life, like uh, lecithin and citric acid. Home bakers also enjoy incorporating soy ingredients in their recipes like tofu. And pictured here is the soy award winner made by a baker from South Carolina. Beautiful, isn't it? Prize winning toppings included a variety of seeds and herbs uh, for flavor and visual appeal. 
like this Lucky Five Spice Cloverleaf Rolls. And this was made by a food blogger from Utah. Egg washes added, uh, added a shiny finish or were used to adhere the toppings. Icing. As you can see, um, we had a variety of ingredients that were used to make unique icing, uh, such as using cream style corn in an icing. The mold spiced apple cider crisp loaf as shown in the picture, is iced with um, made from scratch, mold spiced cider. Now um, I'll let Julene talk about baking inspiration. Well, our findings really resemble much of what David Lockwood mentioned earlier. Um, baking inspirations included family and childhood memories, such as PB&J sandwiches with bananas, uh, packaged pecan twirls from a small town grocery store, and you know, healthy eating. Um, bakers like to incorporate helpful ingredients. Uh, for example, 101-year-old Marjorie Johnson, also known as the Blue Ribbon Baker from Minnesota, she's been featured on Jay Leno many times. Um, she stated in her recipe that her family likes to eat healthy, and she's still baking. Mm -hmm. She's continued to enter our contest since being a finalist in 2009, and she's already inquired about the 2021 contest. <laughs> Uh, so food allergies, health concerns, nutrition benefits, they all influence what people are baking. And, you know, uh, baking bread for breakfast is an inspiration. The smell of bread baking brings the whole family into the kitchen. Uh, bakers mentioned Christmas breakfast treats, birthday breakfast celebrations. Several recipes mentioned baking on a tight budget. Uh, making homemade bread can be economical. And you know, that bottom quote there, yeah. Cindy and I have never heard of mashed potato fudge before. <laughs> we learned some fun things reading the recipes. Bakers were inspired by recreating flavor combinations of memorable or favorite foods and ingredients. Uh, for example, lemon basil pretzels. Those were inspired by basil lemonade and soft pretzels at a music concert. Mm -hmm. uh, and spiced cinnamon buns were inspired by mom's love for spice cake. And baking time saver inspirations, either reduce the number of tools used or the cleanup time or sped up the baking. Uh, for example, using the dough cycle on a bread machine or baking on an electric grill. Another time saver was using convenience ingredients, uh, such as purchased mashed potatoes and pre-cooked bacon, uh, like this picture here of the easy loaded baked potato bread shown there uh, was made by a home baker from Virginia, very tasty bread. And you know, we love when bakers tell us their quick tricks and tips. Several mentioned the window pane test to check dough development. Um, you know, so about a half a dozen or so bakers are using the, the trendy Tang Zong method, uh, which helps the loaf stay tender and soft for days. Uh, and some bakers mentioned that they like to refrigerate the dough overnight. Baker shared speedy baking shortcuts with us, and those included batter breads, single rise breads, no knead doughs, making the dough in a food processor or bread machine, and making rolls now and baking them later. One person said, my goal is to have highly nutritious bread with the least amount of time spent. Amen to that. <laughs> And, you know, travel inspirations. Many recipes were inspired by travels from around the world and ingredients purchased while people were on vacation. Heritage. Heritage was a common influence. One baker wrote, deciding the flavors I wanted to incorporate was a great way to learn more about my heritage. Uh, we saw Finnish, Irish, Filipino, Italian, and Mexican cultures expressed in bread recipes. And this funny favorite quote that Cindy and I enjoyed reading was, the only way to enjoy treats from Mexico is to bake them myself. Those little grandmas don't use the internet. I had to develop the recipes myself. <laughs> and here are some more examples of worldly flavors and breads that were entered in the contest. Um, this quote proves that you're never too old to bake. Uh, one lady was still baking in the nursing home in the final 104 mm -hmm. years of her life. 
Well, now we've shared ingredients and inspirations, and now we're going to share reasons why people bake and how they learn to bake. Well, as you can tell, Julian and I have really enjoyed reading these recipes over the years. Um, and I think the overall theme indicated is bakers bake to show their love and make people happy. It's just that simple. Uh, this is a great quote. Baking together has always been a way for my family to spend quality time. So people bake to remind them of home. And food is one thing that always brings my heart home. And that numerous bakers like to involve kids in the kitchen. Uh, speaking of kids in the kitchen, a predominant theme in the recipe histories was the influence their grandmother and mother had on teaching them baking. And we like this quote. <laughs> I was raised by Granny, and she had me on her coattails in the kitchen. A few bakers cited the internet and online courses and books for their source of baking instruction. Well now, just for fun, we'd like to hear from you. So it's time for our poll question. Tell us, how did you learn to bake? Did you learn from your mom or grandmother? through 4-H or family and consumer science classes at school, online through social media, or another way not listed. Okay, last chance to submit your answer, then we'll close the poll. And some of you may want to see the results. Mom and Grandma, yes. 4-H or school, self-taught other. Great. I can speak for myself that my mother taught me and also 4-H taught me how to bake. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you for taking the poll, and it's great to see how Extension professionals learned how to bake. And so we'll move on to our next slide. Bakers also shared when and how they serve the bread. Um, many families serve the homemade bread, of course, as a holiday tradition, on game days or taken as a snack on camping trips. They serve their bread at crowd-pleasing uh, crowd potluck meals, benefits, and fundraisers. How often do they bake? Well, it varies. Uh, is anyone tuning in from Minnesota? Then you'll appreciate this quote and maybe can relate to it. Baking is a great way to warm up the whole house. One baker said they've been baking their tried and true roll recipe since they were in 4-H. As you can see from our presentation, We've had creative bread recipes entered, and we are very proud of our successful festival. But our seventh national festival of breads will have a different look. So we're planning um, for the 2021 national festival of breads, uh, which will keep the baking momentum going. But with the current situation, Title sponsors have decided to extend our reach by going virtual. So coming soon, you'll find detailed information about entering the contest at nationalfestivalofbreads.com. And we'd love for our extension professionals to help us promote the contest. Um, and we'd like for you to promote it to youth and adult bakers. The complete rules and press release will be available on our website just very soon. Now we will conclude with this short video clip.
with Home Baking Association and Julien Derushi is the Test Kitchen co-director here at the National Festival of Breads event. She's a family and consumer sciences educator. We love it. And this gives you a little glimpse into what a test kitchen facts professional can do. It also gives you a glimpse into what home bakers who decide they want to set their notch higher will do with everything in terms of National Festival of Bread competitions. So Jolene, tell us about what some of your winners do and what your website helps us with. Well, our website and our contest is a great opportunity for bakers' skills and originality to rise to the top. What inspires you to bake bread? Welcome to the Kansas Wheat Test Kitchen, home of the National Festival of Breads. Kansas wheat farmers are proud to support and celebrate the art of home baking. I invite you to visit our website, nationalfestivalbreads.com. You'll find well-tested recipes like this chai ube rosette roll. Today I'm going to show you how to shape these pretty rolls. I've already rolled out this flavorful light purple colored yeast dough and using an English muffin cutter I've cut circles in the dough but if you don't have one of these no worries you could use a wide mouth canning jar ring. Next I place the circles three in a row vertically slightly overlapping them and starting from the short side I roll up sealing the edges as I go then make a cut in the center the beauty of this shaping technique is that you're forming two rosettes at the same time. Place them cut side down in a greased muffin tin. Let them proof and bake. This champion recipe, along with all of our past champions and finalist recipes, are featured on the National Festival of Bread's website, along with nutrition information, farm to table, bread sculpting, and links to our great partners like the Home Baking Association and the Wheat Foods Council. The National Festival of Bread's Baking Contest provides an opportunity to connect home bakers with quality ingredients and let their baking creativity shine. For a taste of the festival experience, check out our photos and schedules from our past events. Amateur and avid bakers alike have savored the chance to see bread baking in action and learn baking hacks from industry experts and ingredient sponsors. The festival is constantly changing and growing, so stay up to date by following us on Facebook, Pinterest, and Instagram. Thank you for watching, and let this be your inspiration to let your bread baking creativity shine. Julene, when we talk about a family consumer sciences professional, I just have to ask you, what do you love about working in the test kitchen with National Festival of Breads? I just love all the flavor combinations that we see, the creativity, and you know, it's just fun to work with people and share the, the joy and the art of bread baking. And I have to say that when you go to National Festival of Bread's website, you will see the amazing level that home bakers have taken, those explorations. And you kids, the kids, the students may want to be bloggers someday, they may want to work in a test kitchen, it's a great place for them to start. Thank you, Jolene. On behalf of Home Baking Association, we love you. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you, Jolene and Cindy. That's great. We're going to go on now with quality baking temperatures, something that contributed greatly to those National Festival of Bread's winners. So, Chef, I hope you're ready, and we're going to go ahead and pull up um, that presentation. So hang in there with me while I get the right PowerPoint going. There we go. All right. We wanted to take a minute with this presentation to focus on temperatures and their importance for quality, food safety, and repeatable results. And that's um, just essential in terms of whether or not you're a home baker, a community baker, a school food service baker, or any other of the bakers who do um, cottage industries that Extension serves. 
So Chef Martin Earl is here with us today. He's a corporate chef with ThermoWorks, and I'm here as well um, from family Con from homebaking.org. And we just want to focus especially on temperatures and their role in um, reproducing what we do um, in home baking. This smart snack whole grain apple cinnamon roll is one we developed for school food service as a smart snack. You'll find a whole deck of 13 of these smart snack whole grain recipes ready to go in our recipe section. We also want to talk about baking food safety very quickly. Um, we mentioned the edible um, home, home baking doughs that are available in the grocer's case right now. But the truth is the majority of home bakers who are consuming raw dough still need your education. This slide will be available from our deck that we give you, but just to emphasize that flour falls in the same category as raw burger or raw eggs anytime they're cooking or baking, and therefore should be handled in a similar manner. We know, as David pointed out, that we're eating that dough at home, if, even though we are practicing food safety practices with eggs and raw meats and, and cross-contamination, we somehow haven't quite gotten it across that flour also needs to be handled properly. In fact, what it needs is it needs to be baked. It's, it's clean. We clean it in the field, we clean it at the mill, we clean it before we mill it, but it's not cooked or baked. And we wish that we could just put up a sign and everybody would listen, but we have a very defiant consumer base. So the earlier question about why um, Pillsbury is selling a ready to eat raw dough is because people want that. They, they are looking for ways to do that. And you can find that in hundreds of posts all over social media. But that commercial ready to eat flour is not available for home bakers, nor for school food service bakers. It comes at a price. So when Pillsbury sells that ready to eat dough, they have paid for a flour or produced a flour that is ready to eat. And it's important for us as um, facts educators to point out that that is not something that's available at home. And it's not even something we can do at home. We need to bake to temperature with internal temperature being the example so that we know um, that we have the product done, that the flour is baked and we can um, call that product safe. I'm gonna turn this over to Chef now, are you ready? I'm ready. All right, and he's going to share his screen with you and demonstrate what we also have available in a video on our website. So note that he's gonna present this video we see and you see in the center is on our website and he's gonna sum up live for us some of these points about temperature. Thank you, Chef. Thank you. Let's see. Can you stop sharing your screen? Oh, oh, oh okay, sorry, I'm just thinking you're gonna grab it. Sorry, okay. No, I'm, not, I'm not grabbing anything. Okay, share just... screen. You should be able to get it now. All right, there we go. Uh, can everybody see me? Sharon, do you maybe turn off your camera too real quick? I can. Am I on the screen? You are. Okay, good. Nice. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Chef Martin from ThermoWorks. Um, we are the, the, the temperature experts. Um, and I wanted to talk to you today briefly about uh, what it is that, uh, about using temperature in cooking. Um, so I want to start out uh, just by introducing myself. I have a science background. Uh, I got a bachelor's degree in physics, and then I went on to, um, uh, to become a chef. Uh, it's an interesting roundabout way of getting places, but it's been really fun. Um, but it's also given me an interesting perspective on food and food science. So uh, I can talk about that some. Uh, I want to start by asking a question, just an informal poll, not a question, not really a poll. Um, but uh, how many of you uh, who are teaching classes uh, in baking and things like that, who are teaching people how to bake, tell people that they can just eyeball the flour amount that goes into a recipe? And of course, that's ridiculous. Um, no, one, no one says just eyeball the flour. You might eyeball, eyeball the vanilla, uh, you might eyeball the pepper, but you're never gonna eyeball the flour. Um, but 
nonetheless, we, we teach people that we should basically eyeball the amount of heat that we put into a recipe. Heat is an ingredient uh, in any recipe. Uh, it's not just um, something that we do to it. It's not like, uh, like flouring the outsides. It's not like rolling. Um, it's actually adding something to it. We're adding heat to a recipe and the amount of heat, heat that we add to a recipe, to a baked good, changes its structure, changes its chemical composition, changes its physical makeup, and changes uh, how enjoyable it is, as well as uh, affecting the safety. So um, while we would never ever say, pour flour into a bowl for five seconds and use that much flour, we do tell people to cook bread or cookies for 10 to 15 minutes, um, which first off, is a wide range, <laughs> um, uh, but also it, it, it's, it doesn't take into account all the other factors that may be going on. Uh, initial temperatures of, of dough ingredients, efficiency of the oven, um, hydration in the flour will affect how quickly uh, water escapes or stays in, how, how much time it takes to heat up uh, uh, the, 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 the baked good just based on uh, how much water there is already in the flour, for instance, when you go in. None of that is taken into account when a recipe says cook for 10 minutes. Um, nor is it taken into account when a recipe says thump the bottom of the bread to see what it sounds like, uh, to see if it's done. I don't know what a hollow bread sounds like. I still don't know what that means. I've been cooking for a long time. Um, but there is a way to actually measure the amount of heat that we've put into, uh, uh, in, in, into a recipe, and that is with temperature. And that's what I want to talk about today. Um, really, we should all be talking about temperature when it comes to baked goods. It seems uh, counterintuitive, maybe. Uh, maybe our grandmothers that taught us to bake didn't use thermometers to tell when things are done. Maybe our mothers didn't. Maybe our, our teachers didn't teach us that. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. Um, you know, w this is uh, family and consumer uh, sciences, not family and consumer folklore. So uh, it's two different, two different things. Um, so we can talk uh, about what, what, that, what that means for us. Really, there's kind of a good, better, best way to handle temperature. A uh, good way to handle temperature is to use any thermometer. Um, any thermometer is better than no thermometer. Uh, so that's going to be an improvement over, over using none. A better thing to do is to use a digital thermometer. Um, so I have here a couple of different thermometers. Uh, this is, of course, a standard dial thermometer. Uh, this one is, is, is uh, supposedly a, a really wide range one. It goes from 50 all the way up to 550 degrees. So it's theoretically good for everything. Actually not that great for very many things because it's not accurate enough. You've got this dial here um, that goes all the way around and trying to figure out exactly where you are on that dial is pretty tough. Um, and so that doesn't, that, they're not great, but it's better than nothing. Uh, you know, uh, you can temp a loaf of bread with this. You can't really temp a cookie. We'll talk about that later. Um, better would be to get a digital thermometer. Um, a digital thermometer will read more quickly and more accurately than one of these. They're less likely to go out of calibration. Uh, so that's better. And of course, best would be to get a fast and accurate uh, thermometer. Um, uh, the Home Baking Association has sent, uh, you know, we, we've talked to the Home Baking Association. Uh, they love the Thermopop. It's a fast, it's a accurate to 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, so that's one degree Celsius. Um, that's like the standard uh, for, for a lot of places. Um, it's got a really small tip, so it's, it reads quickly. Um, this isn't all just a sales pitch. This is, this is you know, uh, what we want to talk to you about. But uh, so you know, um, as educators, you have access to a, an educator discount here at Thermoworks. If you contact Wes Gilger at Thermoworks, uh, he can set you up with an educator discount. Uh, email him at wes.gilger at thermoworks.com. Uh, he can set you up, or you can just call us and ask to talk to Wes. Um, there's only one Wes here. So um, as educators, you're, you're, you're entitled to that, that discount. Um, but getting a fast and accurate thermometer really is the best thing uh, because you don't, when you're baking something, often it's a high temperature, temperatures are rising quickly. You wanna have something that's going to give you a reading now in just a second or two, 
not that you're gonna have to wait 15, 20 seconds for with the oven door open, um, with the, the, the cookie or whatever changing temperatures. Um, so first off, the, uh, this, this is a revolutionary idea to some people um, that, uh, uh, that we can use temperatures because it was never taught to them. But uh, really all baked goods do have a doneness temperature. And just to talk briefly about some of those, um, or uh, um, yeah, sorry. Uh, breads, uh, rich, rich dough breads that have lots of sugar or butter in them, those are done between 180 and 190 degrees Fahrenheit. You can put a thermometer in it and you can know when it gets to that temperature, it's done. Lean dough breads like Cuban bread or Italian bread and things like that, uh, those are done at between 190 and 210 degrees Fahrenheit. Now that's kind of a wide range that will depend on the hydration of the dough and things like that. But so both of those, the rich breads and the lean breads, those overlap at 190 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, so if you can't remember which one's which, just know that all breads should be done at about 190 degrees. And you, by temping them, you're going to eliminate that, you know, sometimes you bake bread or, or your students will bake bread or something like that. And you get a doughy center in the middle there and, and nobody likes that. Not, not anybody. Um, and, and so you can avoid that altogether. Um, cookies, chocolate chip cookies done between 175 and 185 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and you can use the thermometer for that. Uh, just stick it, in, stick it in there and temp it. Um, a digital thermometer, let's talk about, actually we'll go back just real quick here. Um, one of the problems with these dial thermometers, I'm going to hold this up right here. Every dial thermometer has on it a little notch right there. See that guy? Can you see the notch? I hope you can see the notch. Um, uh, that is where the sensor ends. So we've cut one of these apart. This is the entire sensor for this. So the, the, this thermometer is taking a, uh, the temperature over the average of this whole thing. So if you stick this into a cookie, and the cookie is this tall, you're getting a lot of air temp mixed with a lot of cookie temp. Uh, for that to actually get up to what the cookie's actual temperature is, you're gonna overcook your cookie. So those aren't really great for, uh, for baking or anything else for that matter. Um, the Thermopop and many other uh, digital thermometers, the sensor is right there in that cone-shaped tip, right there. Um, in fact, you can see we've taken one of those apart here. This little bead right here, that's the sensor right there. So it also takes less time to heat that up so it actually comes up to the real accurate temperature um, than, than this, which you have to heat that entire shaft before things go. So uh, a digital thermometer, a fast and accurate digital thermometer, you can actually get this into the cookie. You, not only that, but you can take the temperature at the bottom of the cookie. So if my finger is a cookie, you can get the temperature at the bottom of the cookie, center of the cookie, the top of the cookie. You can actually take the temperature at exact locations going through. Um, and, and that's really fantastic. Um, I saw somebody ask the question, how much does the Thermopop cost? Uh, and you know, I feel really bad. I should know that number off the top of my head. I believe that they are, I'm, I'm just gonna look, because I don't wanna quote you bad information. Um, <clears throat> they are $34, uh, but there is a, like I said, an educator discount that you have access to. Um, and also if you buy them in quantity, you can get a, a price break on that. Um, but it is, it is far more accurate than your, uh, your Walmart thermometer, um, your, your home goods thermometer and things like that. Uh, these are much, much more accurate. So uh, getting back to, to, to so, so cookies, cookies are done between 175 and 185 degrees Fahrenheit. Dense cakes like banana bread, zucchini bread, pumpkin bread, quick breads like that, those are done at 200 degrees Fahrenheit. Cheesecake, which is kind of a custardy sort of thing, is done at 145. So if you pull your cheesecake out of the oven at 145 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, you're much less likely to get that split on the top where it cracks and everything goes apart. That happens when the proteins overcook and tighten up too much and they pull apart from each other and they actually cause that cracking. You want to uh, get the proteins in a cheesecake to just barely coagulate, but not rip each other apart. 
There are more resources on this on the Home Baking website, uh, Home Baking Association website. You can look at, uh, they have charts that show different temperatures for different things, custards, etc. cetera. Um, but uh, the, 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 the important thing to remember is that we do this, we talk about these temperatures because of repeatability. Uh, we talk about it because of safety. Sharon talked about flour and how it's not safe to eat raw. Um, and, and, and there's some other things uh, about safety, obviously eggs and things like that that we want to watch out for. But really, if you're already in the safe zone of things, what you need temperature for is for repeatability. Um, uh, you know, I all the time, I make recipes up. Uh, it's what I do. I just make things up. And then I, if I don't write it down, it's gone forever. Um, uh, if I'm making caramels at home, though, I know exactly what temperature I want my caramels to be to make it exactly the right chewiness that I want. Um, and I know what temperature I want my cakes to be so that they're as moist as I want them to be, but, but as done as I want them to be. And you can only do that really with thermometry, only by actually measuring the temperature. Um, you know, sticking a toothpick into a chocolate cake and seeing if it comes out clean. I'm, I'm sorry, I've never had that actually work really well for me. <laughs> um, and, and, and all these things. But by using actual science, using actual measurement, we can actually tell how done, th how done things are um, so that we can have repeatable results that are high quality every time. Um, if it's coming out dry, change, change something about it. If it's coming out underdone, change something about it, increase the temperature and go from there. Um, one other thing I, I didn't mention, we, there, there are other kinds of thermometers uh, you can use and I should mention this. We have, uh, and, and, and other people have too, um, leave-in probe thermometers like this. This is great because you can put this, once you've had the oven spring on a loaf of bread, you can stick this into the bread and you can set the alarm out here and you don't have to open the, temp open the oven every time you want to look at the temperature. Um, you just look at this, and you can tell the temperature um, from outside the oven and it will sound an alarm when you get to your 190 or your 195, you know, wherever it is for that bread that you want. Um, so a leave-in probe thermometer is great. Also, you can actually use this to check the accuracy of your oven. Um, a lot of people don't realize that ovens are not perfect, perfect things. Um, they have a, a, a thermostat. They get hotter than the temperature set. They go lower than the temperature set, and they go back and forth on that. If you want to know how accurate your oven is and how far, how far distant those two peaks are from your set temp, and if it's even averaging out to the right set temp, you need to watch the temperature over time. And you can really do that uh, with, an, with a thermometer like this. Um, but again, this is about safety. This is about repeatability. And this is about actually doing things using science, using measurement. Uh, we would never eyeball flour. And I hope that we would never eyeball, uh, eyeball uh, a heat also. So uh, again, this is Chef Martin from ThermoWorks. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, of course, uh, I'm open to any questions. I see some have come in here through the chat. I don't know if I need to answer those now, Sharon. How do we want to go go ahead with this? Yep, there's there's Wes's uh, email address uh, in the chat. We've also um, got a slide to share with, uh, with the summary for that too. Yeah. If I can yeah. do that, you, are you good with that? Yes, go ahead. Uh, and uh, you you can show the summary and and. There is a video available through the HBA where I say basically all the things that I just said here, um, but not sitting in a, in a storage room, uh, <laughs> uh, but in a kitchen with some examples live that you can even show your students. So we did have one question. I don't yeah. think we got answered. Does that cord stay in the oven door? Yes. Uh -huh. so, 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 so this cord is, is safe uh, up to like 750 degrees. Um, this whole thing is oven safe. Um, the unit itself is not oven safe. Don't put this in the oven. This has magnets on the back and sticks to the outside of your oven. Uh, you just run the cord in and it doesn't let any heat out. The, 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 the gasket on the oven just goes right around the cord. So um, I've run, uh, because the experiments I do here, I've run 15 uh, thermometer uh, uh, um, uh, probes out of an oven at the same time and had no heat loss. Um, it's messy, but, it's, but you can do it. It's, it's no problem. So I use this for roasts. I use this for deep frying. I use this for um, bread baking, uh, things like that. They're, they're really, really useful.
we have another question. This is a yeah. good one. Where is the best location to check the temperature of different products? Ah, that's an excellent question. Uh, the best location is right in the very center. So uh, heat penetrates from the outside in, right? So whatever part of the, of the baked good is the very furthest from the, any exterior point uh, will be the coldest. Um, and that's called what we call the thermal center. Um, and, and you're always gonna be kind of guessing at that. But one, one advantage uh, to an, a thermometer that's fast, this is the Thermapen. This is kind of our Cadillac model. This is, this is a really good thermometer. This is a really better thermometer. Um, it's just more fun. Um, so if I had a loaf of bread, the thermal center would be right here. So I can stick my thermometer in and I can actually watch the temperatures change on their live as I pull it up through, you monitor the temperature and you look for the lowest temperature on the screen. Any baked good, any food is only as cooked as its least cooked part, right? Um, chicken, if there's a part of the chicken that's 135 degrees, that whole chicken is 135 degrees. Um, so as you pull up through, you look for the lowest temperature and that's, and that's your doneness temperature. So the whole, that, that should be as you go through the center probably. Now there's some variation on that. If you're tempting pancakes, which you can do, um, you know, the, 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 the bottom part will be warmer than the top part, which has been cooling off. So you're gonna like adjust for that. But you need to watch for the lowest temperature that you see as you draw up through the baked good. Um, don't check it in the center like this. Go as close, to, or don't check, check it out to the side. Do check it near the center. Uh, you can go straight in like that and come up. You can go to the side and come up like that. Um, if you've got a cookie, you know, you can kind of just stick it into the cookie from the side or you can go in from the top, like so. I hope that answers the question. Any other questions? Okay, Chef, will you be with us to the end, right? To, you're yeah, gonna I think I, I'm, I'm planning on sticking around. Okay, so when okay. we ask the baker, let's do a few more with Chef, and I'd like to just flash that slide up there for, um, for you. Okay, we do have a few coming in, but we'll wait till the end for those. I think let's um, hang, yeah, don't lose track of them. When you see this image of Chef Martin, it's on the baking food safety section and also in the video YouTube section of our website with him demonstrating how to take those temperatures just like he's shown you um, live just now. And you see at the base of this slide, the contact for the educator special that he's giving to you or they are giving to you um, right now. We have a poll question for you. Could we take that poll? Sure. The key to this is the internal temperature of baked goods. We know we take lots of internal temperatures for meats and other products, but what about baked goods? Okay, let's see our summary. Can we do that? So we see where we are. We're at a, uh, we're and I think maybe maybe part of the principal piece of it is lack of equipment. So we we love that we have this educator special from ThermoWorks. Thank you for taking the poll. I'm going to stop sharing and turn this back over to Charlene to close us to get us into the Ask the Baker section session. Here we go. Do I have the, no, I don't have the right one. Let me go back, I'm sorry. Sharon, I didn't share the right one. Uh-oh. Have a little patience here, Sharon. I'm sorry. Thought we had this all 
ready here. Okay, I think maybe now we will have it. There we go, sorry about that. We want to thank you for joining us. We know that we really want to salute you as Extension ed Educators because you're really critical educators that just reach a wide variety of audiences from early child care to adult. And baking has a part and a role in that for everyone. And we hope that you're getting lots of ideas today that you can share. When we look at this slide, I want you to remember homebaking.org. That is our new website and we're continually adding and developing with that. Um, as we want to highlight some of the things that we've talked about today that you'll find back on our website. One of the areas we have is the learn section. And when you hit that drop down box, you're gonna see all kinds of things. But one of the new sites that we have there is distance learning. And you'll see that we put that together. Sharon has done an awful awesome job of developing a lot of materials and things that were needed critically during the last few months as baking questions came up. New sourdough baking, um, we have exper experiments, lessons, activities um, that will meet the needs of the audiences that you work with. The glossary is really an exciting part of our website. We have more than 550 definitions and those link to videos in many of those cases that you can use. Um, the video section offers about 40 to tutorial and references that we're doing, whether they're recipes, whether they're uh, references on how to measure, you'll find all kinds of teaching uh, videos that you can use. And then as you've learned today from visiting and learning from our members, we have members that are providing all kinds of additional resources. So go to the member section and then there's a direct link to all their sites. So whether you want a farm to table video to learn more about a particular agriculture crop, if you want test kitchen information, we have lots and lots of information that links from homebaking.org directly to our members. And then recipes. Everyone always wants recipes. One of the exciting things that we added to our website, our new website is skill levels. So you'll see the recipes have what skill level that might be so that you can easily adapt that for the situation that you're using for teaching. We have home and culinary recipes. And then as Sharon mentioned, we have the smart snacks that we're also providing um, that's a wonderful resource for in school and anyone who needs to follow those new guidelines. And in addition to that, then we have more than 300 activities and resources that really are there to help you um, as you're teaching. Our monthly features, um, we offer a baking calendar of events and hospitality and hacks. We have our blog that Sharon does each month and the free e-newsletter. Be sure you sign up on our website for the free e-newsletter because if a member like the Kansas Wheat Commission provided their uh, Festival of Bread's new recipe booklet, we put that in there. Um, if it was an offer for a special on the thermometer that our chef was talking about, then that's in our newsletter. So be sure to get that newsletter because you'll get all the highlights from the Home Baking Association members of what is happening. Then our weekly features, we've heard so much today about uh, social media. 
be sure to be watching that because we have recipes that we're sharing, hot tips that are coming out um, that we're sharing to give you most up-to-date information. And then if you go to the shop feature on our website, we just want to point out some of the resources that we have here. And you'll see down there in the bottom right hand corners there, these are two posters that we offer. We also on that top line far to the right are the guide cards. The one that's showing is actually our food safety our baking food safety card that includes temperatures on it that this is part of a handout that you can give to um, your attendees at meetings. Um, there's a whole series of five of them from uh, in, uh, ingredient substitutions, measuring substitutions, pan substitutions. They would be great to pass out at meetings. There's 25 of each card in with a group and they're available on our website. But that baking food safety includes an easy um, chart that everyone could put into their kitchen. The other one that I wanted to point out to you is the second one up at the top and that's dough sculpting. So many fun uh, ideas in this particular DVD that's showing the shaping of doughs from basic um, rolls and doughs and bread and pretzels to fun shapes and sculpting. And we'd like for you to think about that one because it would be a great resource for 4-Agers to have. We go down to the next one. This is our Baker's Dozen Labs. And it's been mentioned several times this morning, but that Baker's Dozen Labs is available in a printed version or in an updated version as a USB drive. And when you look at that, you'll see there's 13 labs there. Every extension office should have this. Um, this would be a great uh, resource for 4-H leaders, for anyone who's teaching you. Every lab has um, recipes and uh, tracking in it for baking for beginners, intermediates, and advanced baking. It also has the baking science experiments and then gives you ideas for community service. If you see there, we're offering on our website two of the labs free. So you can check it out and see what it, what it is and if it would be something you think it would be working in your particular extension office. But be sure to look at that. And then there's also the table of contents that it's available on our website for all 13 uh, labs. It's a very extensive resource that would be great for you to have in your extension office. The, this one I wanted to point out to you because it's our Baking with Friends book. It's a hardback book, but it is perfect for 4-Agers who want to get out and be involved in teach and learning um, and because it gives you recipes, but every recipe has a uh, vocabulary word, has a family baking activity, has a, um, a trivia it also has a suggested um, book, uh, a library book. So it, there's, it's filled with uh, teaching aids that will be appropriate for young 4-Agers to help share and give um, programs in the community. I love this chart that we have in there. It starts at two years old and tells you the thrill of skill what can we do in the kitchen so that they'll actually know and they can teach those skills when they're talking. The other great resource in there, and these are also available online that you can print them off, is a checklist for their school, for their skills. So as they teach a, a maybe a 4-H lesson or they go to an after school program, they can check off the skills that they have taught and then have that for all the participants to take home. We also provide this book as a fundraising activity and it is a, a great opportunity to provide a kitchen and to uh, farm to table activity with all kinds of ideas. So visit our website for more details. Bake for family fun. We love bake for family fun at home baking. And you'll see that in our talks today, we've talked about families baking and ideas. So whether it's that gener three generation of family up there that's learning to bake pies and share their uh, family recipes or a family that likes to bake together, 
There are so many things to learn and so many things that we can have our family share their heritage and their special recipes. And you can see each week of Bake for Family Fun is a special week from Let's Get Started Baking for week one, Baking for Someone Special, which is Valentine's week, and then Baking History and Tradition and baking for others. So look that at our website. It's every February and all of our Home Baking Association members provide lots of resources, activities, and ideas each year. Now we'd like to do another poll question and see what would help you teach baking. We've given you lots of ideas today. Can you help us and tell us what of these, and you can check as many as you want to, but let us know so that we can provide those on our website. And we'll give you just a minute here to do that. Lots of choices there, but this will really help us to know what you would like and what we can provide to you. Do we have the results of that? Hey, I'm still coming in. I'm just gonna wait another 15 seconds. Oh, that's great. That is great because we want to um, develop materials that you can use and this will help us how to do that. We know that you reach so many different types of audiences and have so many uh, opportunities to use things. So look there, lesson plans, 80%, baking activities, everything is really high there. That's great. We'd love to provide materials for you and we will work on that to provide new things and provide that also to our members so that they will know the kinds of things that you're looking for. Now we want to award you because we know that you're doing all kinds of wonderful, great things teaching, but we want to give you a little incentive and that's our educator award. Each year, the Home Baking Association rewards an educator um, for an outstanding baking activity, a lesson. You can win $1,000 and a trip to the Home Baking Association annual meeting. The entry deadline is March 31st every year. You can go to homebaking.org and you can see entry information and some of the specifics of the details and even some of the lessons that have won. This last year, we were excited to recognize Marla Prusa. She is actually a family and consumer science teacher in Nebraska, but we also had three honorable mentions that we wanted to recognize as well. And even though these are family and consumer science teachers, we've had winners from Extension as well. We even had a youth that won one year, um, an honorable mention that had done a baking activity as a result of uh, being at National 4-H Congress and learning about this program. So please share that with your youth and with others in your county and your communities. We'd love to have a, a winner from your area. At this time, I just wanna thank you so much for being with us today. We're going to have baking kits for those of you that um, ordered it that we're going to be sending out. And we're also going to have an opportunity for you to ask questions to our panel. But I wanna thank you for joining us. And I also wanna thank our um, speakers for participating with us today. Sharon, are you ready for Ask the Baker? I, I am. Are you all else? Can you all open up your, uh, yeah, we see Chef, Cindy, Ali, yeah, pop on your videos. And Madison, do you want to start with some questions for us? Yeah, we have quite a few fl flowing in. So we'll start with a question from Annette. What about recipes with no temperature recommendations? What do we do there? Sure. So um, temperature, recommend temperature recommendations uh, shouldn't vary too much from recipe to recipe among one given class of baked goods. So um, all of your quick bread, dense cake, things like that, you know, your pumpkin breads and things like that. Uh, if you come across a new recipe for that, it doesn't have a recommendation, cook it to 200 degrees. Um, 
There, uh, the HBA has, uh, like I said, resources on this. Um, I'm working on making some resources here at ThermalWorks uh, that, will, that will be useful for that too. Um, try with a known temperature, and then if that doesn't give you quite the result you want, you can increase or decrease your temperature a little bit based on your results, and then write that into the recipe for yourself uh, for next time. Go ahead and mark up those recipe cards, mark up those books, make them work better for you. That's great. That, that guide sheet, when you receive your resource chart from this event, you're going to receive in, a, in an, an upcoming email from Danielle, you'll receive a chart with live links to all of these resources we've been mentioning. Those who paid for a baking kit will get a sample thermal pot, a real one. Yeah, we can't download that. And a few other items that um, our members would like you to have. So I'm um, just saying that's for mailing and handling costs. That's what that extra $15 is for. So I'm just saying that chart will come to you on your resource sheet. Okay, great. So we have another question from Nellie. How do we keep from deflating yeast bread? I'm assuming deflating it when you're checking, checking the temperature. Wait until yeah. it's nearly done. Um, uh, you don't have to wait until you're nearly done. Uh, there's kind of two ways of going about it. If you're going to use a leave-in probe, you're going to wait until it has done the oven spring and then set up. You know, it goes from being flat to going like this and then it goes down a little bit more. Anytime after that point, you should be okay to go ahead and stick a thermometer in, thermometer in there uh, to leave it in. Um, if you don't have a leave-in probe thermometer, uh, you can use those time recommendations start checking the temperature at the earliest time in the time recommendation and go for the temperature that you know you're looking for. So if it says cook for 25 to 35 minutes, get a thermometer in there in 25 minutes and check it to see if it's at the temperature that you want. Um, and that's kind of the, a, a good guideline for that. Those starches and proteins gelatinize or set up before the product is actually done. So unless you're testing for temp early on, like Chef is saying, too early, like before the minimum uh, time gives you in the, in the recipe guide, you shouldn't deflate your product. Yeah, exactly. And, those, and the proteins also coagulate at, 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 at a lower temperature. A lot of what you're going for is actually driving off excess water um, in there that's gonna come off the steam that will make it bad. So yeah, thanks Sharon for that too. Okay. Um, next question, when substituting whole wheat flour for AP flour, can you go up to half without compromising the end product? Well, well, I would like Cindy and Julene they, to answer that for sure, but, but I would just say, yeah, 50-50 is supposed to be your guideline, but what do you think, Cindy and Julene? 50-50 uh, is uh, great for most people um, to try, but you know, in our test kitchen, we've worked on recipes using 100% uh, whole wheat flour. So um, you can go up to 100%. You may have to add more liquid um, to your recipe. May, may even need to add a little gluten also. About a week gluten, yes. So I would just throw out there, and Chef, you could jump in too, but you know, when you, when you decide to add things like OTEF or non-wheat um, based whole grain flours, that's when it gets tricky. And for a long time now in our test kitchens, we've, we've toyed with this amount of percent, 25% or less non-wheat or non-gluten forming flours. You could try that. Let's say you just really want to add variety, which is a good thing. So 25% or less should be roughly workable. And then when you're talking about wheat flours, 50% or less should work generally. Then when you go over that 50% amount, that's when you begin to maybe see a difference in moisture or even gluten strength because the bran in that whole grain makes a difference in how the batter performs or the dough. It cuts into the gluten forming strands. It does various things, absorbing moisture. Chef, do you want to comment? Uh, no, everybody has said all the same things that I, I, and more than I would have said. Those, those are great, great tips. Okay. Okay. We have another question, all, several questions still. I like it. I like involvement. <laughs> How different are liquid measurements from dry measurements? Can I take this one? Sure. 
They're not. Um, depending on how you're on how you're reading it. So um, one cup, a one cup measure is an eight ounce measure. Uh, that's a volumetric measure, and uh, that will hold eight fluid ounces of water, which weighs eight ounces. That's how those measures come together. So if you see one cup of flour, um, then that's gonna be one cup. Nobody knows how much that weighs um, because flour isn't water and it, does, it, like, it can be compacted, it can be expanded. If you sift flour and you take a scoop out of that and you level it off, that's gonna weigh a lot different than if you just dig down into the flour bag and scoop it out. But so uh, the, the, the cup measure, if you fill like, a, 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 like with the handle on it, the metal cup, if you fill that to the top, it should be eight ounces. And when you pour that into a liquid cup measure like a Pyrex or something like that, it should come up to one cup also. Um, the difference is that if you see uh, in a recipe eight ounces of flour, that's not gonna be one cup. That's a weight measurement all of a sudden. So really the difference uh, that people tend, think they're looking at is the difference between weight measure, mass measure, versus volume measure. And those are important distinctions to make. But any measuring cup that is a one cup measure or a half cup measure or a tablespoon measure should be the same whether you're using it for liquids or for dry ingredients. So we're gonna we're gonna go um, to the to the counter side of that chef, and that is because uh -huh. you live in a perfect world, <laughs> and the home baker does not. So uh -huh. um, we actually have an activity in our five minute book in which you take all the different liquid measuring cups and you try uh -huh. measuring one cup. And this is what you should have your 4 hers do. It's like all things are not create, created equal in those measuring cups. So you do that and then you have them weigh how much the liquid or how much the flour weighed in three or four different styles of measuring cups. Because weight is our really, like Chef is saying, weight is truly our common denominator. We would do great if everybody weighed all their ingredients. But because at home we have all these different kinds of measuring cups, help your students learn a good method for liquid and a good method for dry and then have them compare their cups because they really will come up short. And we all wish it would all be exactly the same, but gee whiz, home. Buy, buy good measuring cups. Yeah, that would be and good. They're the same. Just buy good ones. All right. Okay. Madison, what else we got? I appreciate this one since I live in Colorado. Will high altitude affect the done temperature? Uh, Sharon, you're nodding your head. You want to take this? Well, I want to tell you, I, you think a minute on it, Chef, but we know that liquids boil at a different temperature at altitude. At altitude. And I, we want you to know that there is a guide, a really good one, that Colorado Extension has come out with. So I'm gonna shout out to them first of all. They give you all kinds of great at altitude baking guides. We also have one on our website under at altitude and it's in our glossary. And that live links back to Colorado. And the other member who has a hot and great uh, baking guide is King Arthur Flour. They have a great at altitude baking guide. So those are my shout outs to where you get the source because it's more complicated than I can do right now. But Chef, is there another one you want to give? You live out in Utah. Yeah, um, I, I don't have any other uh, sources, uh, but just to talk, address really quickly the, 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 the science of what's going on there. Um, there are a couple things we're going for. We're going for protein coagulation, uh, we're going for starch gelation, and we're going for steam getting out of something. Um, Proteins will coagulate. That's based on just how much energy has run into those proteins. It doesn't have anything to do with uh, altitude. So that's not really affected by altitude. Starch gelation is also not uh, well affected by altitude. So really what you're looking at is, is mostly just the water content in something for the most part. Um, so doneness temperatures might vary a little bit. Um, uh, the highest number that they could vary is by up to two degrees per thousand feet. I haven't observed that that is the case. That's true for, uh, for um, sugars, for if you're making caramels and things like that, which isn't baking. Um, but if you're making caramels and candies, you subtract two doneness degrees from your syrup for every thousand feet above sea level you are. Um, so you don't overcook because the water does boil more readily 
at these altitudes. So you're driving off water more easily, more quickly, which means you're getting the work done faster at a lower temperature. Um, so uh, I don't know enough about it. I haven't observed many differences when it comes to baking. Um, all the temperatures that I read to you are the ones I use in my own kitchen and they come out great. Uh, and I've had uh, people responding uh, with the same answer from sea level. So I'm going to go with no, but also put an asterisk on that that you should check out your local extension um, for, for uh, better information relating to uh, baking at elevation. And again, we will give a shout out homebaking.org glossary. Go to at altitude or altitude and you will find some good, very basic starts for, for guiding you. And watch for our next, I think for holidays, we should have an altitude baking guide. Let's work on it. But King Arthur Flower has a great one too. Madison, what else you got for us? Many years ago, I learned that we should never open the oven before 20 minutes of cooking because it would stop the raising process. Will that still stand? How much does an oven drop, chef, when you open the door? How much uh, heat or An oven temperature can drop by up to 50 degrees, which is temperature you're going to have to reheat uh, when you go in there. I mean, yeah, I was, and, and that's even for not very long. You, you, you open it quickly you can get a, a, a pretty precipitous temperature drop. So that can have an effect on oven spring, which happens in the first 20 minutes. Um, I, I mean, I, you can't put an exact number on, but I would say that is still, that's a pretty good recommendation. I wouldn't try, I would try to keep the oven closed during the first 20 minutes of any, any baking project. Cindy and Julene, you've been test baking gazillions, gazillions of things. Do you have any advice on that too? No, I think that's good, good advice to keep the oven closed. And um, I, I think getting one of the um, probes that the chef talked about, that's what we're going to invest in. Great. Nice. Hey, David, do you want to comment? We're leaving you out. Allie? <laughs> well, Charlie? Add to that. <laughs> okay, what else we got for questions, Madison? Okay, when you substitute flax seed for eggs, is there an adjustment to the recipe? You, you prepare your flax needs to be not the seeds, but the meal. Okay, really important, meal, you use meal, and you need to prehydrate it. It's, it works a whole bunch better than throwing the flax meal into the batter and then adding the liquid. So put your, uh, what do we, I think just off the top of my head, of course I've got my substitution card here. Just let me pull it up. I think it's one tablespoon of flax meal and three tablespoons of water. Yeah. You mix that in a measuring cup or a small bowl or a custard cup. Mix that first. Let it stand there five minutes. Then throw it in instead of one egg. And you'll find that's much better because that flax meal absorbs. It's absorbing the liquid. But you don't want it to compete with the liquid in the batter. Okay? It's, hey. I, I remember one time a chef baker told me, I think it was Stephanie from Panhandle Milling. Um, she, she says, you know, you, if you could hear the competition for liquid in your batter or your dough, and chef, you might want to comment, it'd be like a cacophony, an orchestra, all playing at the same time. Every ingredient that can absorb water is trying to get all the water. So you don't want to do that to the flour and everything else. So rehydrate your raisins before they go in. Hydrate your flax meal before it is put in, and you will have better success. Yep, agreed. Okay, we have another question. What is the difference between pastry flour and all-purpose? Protein, the protein content. All purpose is the home baker's nemesis because you never know what the protein will be. There's only one brand that guarantees it and that's King Arthur and they'll put it right on the outside of the package. Hmm. The rest you are guessing, but all purpose is supposed to be somewhere between 10 and 11% protein. That means it's supposed to work for most things. You will get not as big a volume in your bread, but you will get an okay tenderness to your biscuit. Pastry flour, though, is going to run another percentage lower, and that will get, begin to give you a more tender pastry. And that chart is in Flour 101. It's on our website, and it's also in our glossary. 
So I think cindykansasweet.com has a good guide to flower 101 too. Okay, so the next two questions, pretty quick. Are the resources such as videos and lesson plans okay to use with our own programming? as long as we use proper citations slash credits that are provided. Should we all say it together? <laughs> yes. Yes. Please, please use our resources and please, yes, give our websites because I know all of us would like to share what we have available on our sites beyond what, what we're talking about today. There's so much, so much out there. Okay. You, should see, you should see the lists of things ThermoWorks offers in their learning center. And at Kansas Wheat and National Festival of Breads and sugar.org, there are videos, there are printable lesson plans, there are recipes, there are whole books of information. So go for it. And Charlene, any, go I ahead. Think an easy way to get there is to go to homebaking.org, go to our members section, and it links right to all of our members. Okay. And I would just, I'm going to do an ask for any AFCS, if Daniel's, if Daniel's out there. You used to have a great way to locate the extension office nearest you, the fax professional nearest you. We could really use that. We give shout outs to extension all the time, and we'd love for people to know how to locate you. So um, keep sending us what you've got, and let's talk some more. But are we at the end of our time? You have seven minutes, Sharon. We do, okay. Are there any more questions for us? We have two more questions. Um, any suggestions for baking with almond flour? Well, I should let Cindy and Julina answer first. I've got a few. How about you, Allie? You got one too? I have some ideas, but go for it. When you bake with almond flour, what do you like to bake? Chef, you can answer too. I only use almond flour for a very few number of things, um, making macarons and making zacher torta. That's just about all I, all I use it for. I will occasionally use it as a thickener in sauces um, for a, just a slightly different flavor and texture. Um, but I don't, I'm, no, I'm no expert in using almond flour. Okay, Cindy and Jolene. We've just had a handful of recipes over the last few years that came in. Um, using almond flour. Of course, we ask that 75% um, of the flour in the recipe be wheat flour, uh, since we're sponsoring <laughs> the contest. Um, but um, I, I can recall one of the top recipes was a almond roll that was wonderful with almond flour and almond paste and almonds with the icing flavored with almond extract. So um, I think people are using almond flour to bring out some of those flavors and to make the recipe original. So almond flour is a really favorite uh, gluten-free flour right now. And I see a lot of options with it for cookies. And, um, and that's a natural because it you wouldn't necessarily have to have a lot of protein in a cookie and it gives a great flavor. Of course, it's extremely nutritious too. A whole nut uh, meal like that is really good for you. So um, working with it, even at a low percentage, meaning maybe just one eighth of your flour would give you an experiment into adding it similarly to adding more whole grain. In, the, in this case, it's a whole nut meal. It's also really good in scones or, or pastry, um, a pie pastry with an almond uh, flour base. It's delicious. Mm -hmm. Allie, have you seen it with your um, sugar association? Uh, not as much. Um, I, I giggled a little bit because my roommate tried to make almond flour cookies over the weekend, and she, she has succeeded, I would say, but it's definitely a, tr a trickier one to work with than your um, more common flours. Charlene, you have a daughter with celiac. Has Jana done any work with uh, almond flour? I don't believe so, but we're doing some experimenting with some. It's a great way to get families involved when you have someone 
in your family that has a special needs um, to get the family involved in trying new things and supporting that individual. We do have, Sharon maybe had mentioned, the kitchen science activity. And it is a lesson that's free on our website. Really, it's a four page color handout, but really great for 4 agers to have or for you to have for adult meetings that give suggestions for substituting different ingredients, no matter what that food sensitivity might be. So with that, just I'll just say a heads up when you're working with kids and you're doing that test kitchen kitchen science, start with a muffin or a pancake. And, and then use those small percentages of different flours to compare taste and flavor and outcome. Pancakes and muffins are very forgiving that way. Um, a cupcake less so, uh, but, but we do do a banana cupcake uh, experiment with eggs, substituting out eggs. Um, it's in the egg section of the lab manual. So kitchen science, thank you, Charlene. That's a good one to go to because it has a lot of substitutions in it. Hey, here's another question. Is there a guideline to adjust the amount of yeast used for whole wheat breads to lighten the density without making the taste too yeasty and still have a light crumb non-dense bread? The, the operative with whole grain breads is gluten, not yeast. Okay, so you want a high protein flour in the first place. So those of you who live east of the Mississippi Okay, get yourself in your geography, east of the Mississippi, and maybe in the Pacific Northwest, you are in soft wheat country. So if your whole wheat flour is locally produced, you might find that your whole wheat breads are heavier just because you don't have enough protein in your wheat to really cause the lift. So it would be like you trying to develop a dough with elasticity when there isn't enough gluten to start with. So your flour, that doesn't mean it's not great flour. It's just better for lower protein products like anything from muffins, cakes, cookies, pastries, etc. And you might have to actually use a little bread flour or some people will use vital wheat gluten to boost that gluten strength in their whole wheat product. So you can't pump more yeast in to make the product lighter. You need to either knead it and develop it and be sure you have a high protein flour or you need to add some gluten perhaps. Cindy and Jolene, you want to comment on that? Well, I would just say, Sharon, remember when we worked together, we had one of the best 100% whole wheat bread recipes. Yeah. And I think a lot of that is the method. You start with the sponge and cover it up and let it set for about 30 minutes. And then also we would give the dough a second rising time. And I think that's one of the secrets of making a really nice um, whole wheat bread. I know I've made it and served it to audiences and it's more like eating a piece of angel food cake. So I still think that is one of the best recipes, Sharon, that we um, worked with. And I think it's on our National Festival of Breads uh, website, 100% whole wheat flour. And of course, I like to use a white whole wheat flour um, in the recipe nowadays. Absolutely. And of course, that is hard, a hard wheat flour. So go ahead, Julie. And I'll just re-mention that Red Star Yeast has their platinum yeast, and it has dough enhancers in that yeast product and makes a great product with excellent oven spring, even whole grain products. That is a really good point, the new platinum Red yeah. Star actually does give you a boost up uh, in terms of flower quality when you don't have it. Chef, do you have something you'd like to mention too? Oh, you've, uh, you, you've all hit it on the head there. I was gonna say gluten is the important thing. Add more gluten, not more yeast. I think those long fermentations, like Cindy's saying, two rising times, your grandmother knew all about it back in the old days. She, she'd mix it up into a sponge. She would then finish it out when she ate the next step. Then once it was needed, she'd let it raise once or maybe even twice. And she did not try to rush the, rush the, the timing. She might even put it in the refrigerator if she had time. Now we have those long fermentation doughs and that long fermentation, if you could imagine gluten, it's all mixed up. When it, when it has time and that yeast is fermenting, it just starts straightening up 
the gluten strands. So that means that it lifts the dough as time goes and it strengthens the gluten strength of the flour. So those long fermentations are ideal. You might want to teach refrigerator doughs because people are short on time. More questions at Madison? Yeah, I know we're running short on time, but we do have some more. Um, what is this? Uh, is the shelf life of whole wheat flour different than AP flour? What is a typical shelf life? In a cool, dry place, the shelf life of whole wheat flour is no more than three months. Cool, dry, room temperature. If you're not going to use it within three months and you're not even sure, you know, you look at your label on your bag. Your best bet is always to refrigerate your whole wheat flour, but you will have to bring it to room temperature when you're going to bake with it. So uh, remember that. It depends on how fast you use it. I use my whole wheat flour so fast I don't refrigerate it. I just use it. But maybe test kitchens, use it fast. Home bakers, I don't know. Okay. Well, I think we are short on we are short on time. It is time to get rolling there. So we have another poll question. So I think Danielle, if you're ready, we'll pull it up. So how will you share baking 2020 workshop information and resources? Check all that apply. Okay, have we got it? They're still coming in. I'm gonna wait another 10 seconds. Great. Super. So watch for your resource guide. It will be coming. And those who ordered baking kits, those will be coming a little bit later. You won't get them within three days, but they are coming too. Charlene, anything else we're forgetting? I don't think so. We just want to thank everyone for joining us. We want to thank our speakers and visit homebaking.org and then visit all of our members website because they have lots of resources and things that you can use. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Go team baking. Bye. Bye, -bye. <laughs> Bye everyone. Bye-bye.